Tired of traditional talk? People pontificating about this or that, the left or the right. Sometimes the truth is just all lost in the noise. Having learned life lessons the hard way, Chuck Gallagher, international speaker and author, cuts through the noise to share truth through transparency. Nationally known guests talk about what's important to you, your life, your concerns, and your success. So tune in, turn on to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. Now, here's your host, Chuck Gallagher. Hi, this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio, and boy, am I excited about this week's show. You know, it's, it's, it's neat whenever you have the opportunity to talk to the definitive expert in any field. And as far as I'm concerned today, I have got that expert. Now, I have to tell you, my wife and I got hooked into this TV show called Lie to Me. And it really was kind of neat. The guy was quirky a little bit. I'm not saying our guest today is quirky, but, but the guy on the show was a little quirky. But the cool part was, is he was able to observe a, a multitude of things to determine if somebody was telling a lie. And, it, you know, we just got hooked into this, and it was really quite fascinating. So today, my guest is Stan Walters. He is the lie guy. And how cool to be able to be an expert in a field and be in demand by law enforcement agencies, special forces, FBI, you name it. People are calling upon Stan, including corporate clients who want to make sure that the information they're getting is correct. So, Stan, I am thrilled to have you on the show today, buddy. So to be with you, Chuck. Looking forward to it. Yeah, this is this is going to be a lot of fun. Okay, so statistics say that most everybody at some point in time during the day lies. You know, it's, it's, it's just a white lie. It's not like something that's intentional deceit. I'm going to steal from you or do something significant. But, you know, it's these little white lies. Like when your wife says to you, you know, honey, how do I look in, in these pants? Well, you know, if I said, well, darling, you're looking a little porky today, I don't think that we would have a happy relationship. No, 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 no. That's the wrong answer. What, what you ought to say to her is, sweetheart, you must not be sure about it yourself. We're going to be asking somebody as fast and challenged as I am for my opinion. See, that way you don't want us sleeping on the couch. Right. <laughs> and does and does like that, that work? Uh, no, it didn't work on my wife. Okay, well, there we have it. <laughs> you know, you got to try. <laughs> but you've got to try. But, but, but what's the deal behind, um, because this is, this is your field of influence, what's the deal behind people that just feel compelled to tell a lie instead of just being honest? Sometimes I think it's because it's, they want things to be that can't be. They want to be a person who's seen as having extra skills or abilities, so they tell the big whoppers about their their accomplishments, maybe on the resume. Oh, and sometimes you ought to look at, at the studies on how honest people are on resumes. That's frightening. Oh, really? Yeah. It's bad. Only about – there was a study by Florida State University for SHRM, Society of the Human Resource Managers, said that 40 to 70 percent of job applications have material misrepresentations about the qu applicant's qualifications for the job on them. No kidding. 40%. Oh, my goodness. And then, then the personnel people, only about 2 to 3% of the time actually caught that. So when you, when you ask why do people deceive, I don't worry about the social ones, about what you think of my haircut or what do you think of the meatloaf, you know, and where you're, where you're protecting feelings. That's, that's just being polite, but it's not malicious. The, the three lies I, I worry about are called the three H's. When you hide something, to harm the other person or to hype. Hide, okay. hype, and harm. So hype would be like uh, adjusting my resume. And we have seen cases of the stolen valor, for example. Soldiers claiming, a guy's claiming they have all these medals right. or their sponsor force and so forth. So it's hyping the resume. Uh, then to harm, I deliberately lie to you so I can take advantage of you, to hurt you. Maybe like, let's say Bernie Madoff with his investment schemes. Right. Okay. And then hide would be to cover something up that you, uh, the, the person I'm talking to needs to know so you can make an informed, intelligent decision so you don't become the victim of a loss or a uh, victim of the fraud. So those are three that I worry about. 
social things. It just it keeps us from clubbing each other to death. <laughs> so we survive the next day. Well, you know, I, I, I hear the three H's and those are the biggies. I have to say, I wonder on the front side what it is that we do and how we teach our our kids. And and I, I give you a quick example. I was um, I was on a radio show. It was pre recorded, and um, just like this, it was done via Skype. You know, the the, the miracle of modern technology. And um, and the lady that was doing the interview. Uh, apparently had her cell phone in the other room and, and it and it rang. Now I didn't hear that, but her five year old daughter did. And you know, kids love stuff like that. Oh my gosh, I can answer the telephone, you know. And so it answers the telephone, comes busting in the room where mom is doing this interview, and says, "Mom, you got a phone call." And she immediately says, "Tell him I'm in the shower." And I'm sitting there thinking. I'm in an interview where we're talking about ethics and you just told your five-year-old daughter to lie for you because it was apparently more convenient than it was to tell the truth. Yep. You know, and there's a lot of that to example that and, and think that the other way too with the same thought that um, when the child does come off and tell the truth, we go full bore and we punish the dickens out of them for when they told the truth about something. So what's the message? Lie, you don't get in trouble. So right. we've got to be careful how we do that and attached to that in families where there's a lot of deception that goes on relationship. It's, it's just like a, a lot of hereditary, but the kids pass it on and they become desensitized to it at the same time. So the parents and kids cook a pick on the parents and their use of integrity and honesty and see when they cut, uh, cut corners, then so they can as a child and it becomes that pattern with that child. So in the process of what you do, uh -huh. um, before we get into the three of the big H's, in, mm -hmm. in the process of what you do, um, what do you advise people on the front side? Like, for example, you, you just said, well, you know, if there's a pattern of deception in the house. Now, obviously, most people aren't going to have the chance to talk with you before patterns are set. Mm -hmm. But but is there a way to stem that? Is, the, is it just the continued generational issues that have taken place which creates that pattern of deception? Or are there things that people can become conscious of to help break that? I think we can make people conscious of it and we can discipline ourselves. And then let's say that I run across um, a college students, let's just say, for example, I'm working a case of a theft from dorms just for the heck of it. Okay. okay. And I've got a student that recognizes it's doing a lot of deception and I can tell that it's uh, sometimes a lie is told not even for a benefit. It's just the function of doing it. I'll start to do a pattern where I reward them being honest and kind of give a negative feedback when they're dishonest. And so I say in the subject's mind, you know, the best thing you can do to help yourself out, I promise I'll be as honest with you as I possibly can about this case. But to help yourself, you're going to have to be honest too to help you. We at least be honest with me about what's going on. So I and I'm using persuasion tactics to get them the commitment to be honest first. Then when they deceive me, I said, you know, that's not helping you. That makes your case look bad. It looks like you're hiding something. It's going to be better if we open with each other and be frank and we can resolve this as a team. So instead of being an adversarial, we're on the same side and I kind of reward the honesty side of it. Right. Right. Now, do you find that you are, um, I know you're called upon by lots and lots of organizations. Are you typically called on um, to determine what has taken place with a, um, a, a, a I'm going to make it easy for me, a fraudulent situation, like you were using that example, or do you tend to get called upon more on the front side to teach people the process of understanding or detecting in advance that lie that might be taking place. The greatest bulk of my work is the training side, uh, preparing people who are going to go into the job of looking for deception through criminal cases or through I work with environmental protection agencies, uh, child service agencies. I uh, recently got an inquiry from, uh, from oil companies that are investigating the accidents and deaths of men in, in the oil field. And so they have investigators that go out and want to see what happened in that accident. Can we prevent it the next time? So both of my workers on that side, usually when I get called, it's going to be a very high profile, a very complex case that's already been involved, and they need somebody outside the forest to take a look. And, and I'll have them assess, okay, 
from what I'm seeing in your interview, you need to talk about this, talk about this, talk about this. Here's where this guy's problems are. That should be the focus of your your conversation with them. Okay. So before we get to our first break, I want to bring this back to um, a a practical application for everybody that's listening or will be watching on YouTube. So I'm the parent of uh, a teen or an early 20, whatever, the, but to me, a young person. Okay. And obviously in today's world, I want to make sure that, you know, they don't get in trouble. So what is it that I can do? And maybe this goes into our next segment, but what is it that I can do as a parent observing my teen or talking to them to find out if they are deceiving me, which by the way, I kind of guess most teens probably figure at some point they're going to deceive their parents. Well, that's their job description. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm focused a lot on, on accountability, that when you do great things, proper accountability, you get rewarded. So if you're honest and integrity is something that's important and integrity brings a lot of accountability and you get rewarded for that process. But when you mess up, make mistakes, uh, maturity is when you've made a mistake, I realize it and I fix it instead of hiding it, covering up and it compounds the problem. So I look at it from that that process of, of the reputation of the person in your standing if you want to have trust. Okay. So if, if I'm sitting there, therefore, and I want to have trust in the relationship um, or with the relationship, then obviously I want to do the right thing. I guess the question that jumps out at me, and, and we probably need to pick this up after the next break, is what cues am I looking for or clues am I looking for to tell me that something's not right? Okay, no, good question. Uh, we miss 50% of the lives that happen in front of us because number one, we're looking for the wrong symptoms. And number two, nobody told us what the right symptoms are. So when we get back, let's look at some of the myths and we'll talk about verbal cues and body language cues that have some statistical link to possible deception. That's excellent. My guest is Stan Walters. He is the lie guy. Uh, He has a really cool book, The Truth About Lying. And in fact, I would say to you that if you go to theligeguy.com, that's his website, theligeguy.com, there is a multitude of information that I think a lot of people, if you're in corporate America, you certainly would be interested in when it talks to interviewing techniques and and so forth. But also, I, I have I highly recommend the book because I think the truth about lying really gives you some insights. And we're going to pick that up as we come back after our break. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight. Great Talk Radio. Stick with us. So this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio, and we are back with my guest, Stan Walters. He is the lie guy. And we have been talking about the, um, I guess, the reality in everyday world that we all lie. Uh, You kind of said it was to keep the oil going, so to speak, and to make sure that, you know, life isn't... um, well, we're not beating ourselves or each other over the head with clubs. And, and I can understand that. Um, I work in an office and a fair number of women there. And, uh, and, and I get lots of questions, most of which I try to dodge, uh, because some of them are just uh, going to be a little on the dangerous side. But we were finishing in our last segment talking about, you know, if, if it was our teenager, for example, what are the things that we need to be looking for? And you said, well, you know, there's the myths and so forth. So, so talk to us a little bit about the two sides of the coin and what is it that we need to look for? What are the cues? Yeah, let's start with the myths. And okay. there's a loud, wide range of myths, and this is perpetrated in media, in books. And I do a lot of training in military and uh, government academies, police academies. It's even perpetuated in a lot of those academies. I bet you could probably figure this out. What do you think is the biggest myth or the most common thing people look for in deception? What would be your guess? But the first thing to say, if somebody's lying, how do you tell? Well, I'm going to assume that it's probably a body language. Okay. And then when body language, which which area? Uh, eyes. Bingo. Eye contact is the worst thing to watch. Okay. It, it is the least reliable, but it's the most prevalent myth worldwide. One researcher sent uh, folks out to 93 countries, and he asked them, what do you look for in deception? Number one in every country was eye contact. Wow. But there's about 35, 40 studies that show that there's no link between eye contact and deception. The myth being, if you, the person lies, they look away. You know? Right. And 
40% of the human population actually increase eye contact at the moment they lie to you. No 30, kidding. 35% will decrease. So it's unreliable. Then there's a lot of cultural things. You know, in some cultures, it's inappropriate for a female to have strong eye contact with a male. There's a lot of cultures like that. Or any person of a certain class level should not make eye contact with somebody who's a higher authority. So right out of the way, you've got a lot of those myths. One huge myth that's perpetuated is if you ask the question, look to the left, they're recalling. If you ask the question, look to the right, they're constructing. It's an abuse, and I emphasize abuse, of neurolinguistic programming. So the theory of being asked the question, look to the left, he's recalling, so they'll be honest. Look to the right line. There's about 100 studies now showing there's no correlation in eye movement in deception. But now the NLP model for, for dialogue and for counseling and for training that, that folks like you and I use a lot, um, that's a valid system. Now, the rest of the body, uh, fidgeting is not a sign of deception. Oh, there's one I keep hearing, sweating is a sign of lying. Well, there's a whole lot of grooms going to be lying their butt off when they get to the altar next June. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a true statement. So fidgeting and those things, they're, the initial theory about body language and lying back in the 40s was that it created a lot of stress, therefore be lots of body language. What we've learned when a person, lying is a real heady cognitive process. So if you put your mind into it, what happens, the body actually shuts down. It gets quiet. So if you're talking to your kids, you're talking to them, uh, let's say an applicant for the job, or maybe you're looking at someone who's gonna be the caregiver in your home for your parents, and you're asking about the background, their experience and so forth. Um, have you had first aid training? Have you had, uh, had CPR training? Are you bonded, for example? And at that moment, they've been like, say, really active and so it gets quiet. In my mind, I'm thinking, I need to follow up on that a little bit more. Something's changed in their behavior right there. There's a change in the, in the cognitive and emotional response. So it might be a hidden topic I need to explore. Um, arm crossing, leg crossing are not lie signs. Now, the best lie cues, the ones you can trust, come from the voice, but it's not stammering and stuttering. It's not our um and uh, or answering the question of the question. It has to do with what we call the line of thought. Um, the process of lying. Okay, so let's say you and I experience an event and we're gonna lie about it. So in our minds, there, think of a video screen like on your computer, so you got okay. one window, okay? So here's all the sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, emotions, complex grid. What's a lie? It's a second screen with an artificial script. The brain can only handle one window. So now we got two windows going. So the brain's going, which one do I talk about? Which one do I talk about? So it recreates what we call a, co a cognitive load and the term for it's cognitive dissonance. The nickname I like is called being of two minds. Okay. The people concocting deception are actually of two mindsets and the brain's battling which one do I show and how do I censor each part? So that's where the key for deception is, is it's in structure, it, it, it's development, it's generation. So that's where I look as the interviewer and teach my students, look for these keys where there's an unclear thought line, incomplete sentences, um, slurred speech, or they keep repeating the same thing again and again and again, like they're in a loop or they're trapped. We found in research in New York that I worked on that those had a very high proportion, high correlation with somebody being deceptive. So it's in the speech is where you look for it. Now, okay, so l l let me get, I want to get this in my head for a second. Okay. So here I am, mm -hmm. and I'm going into a job interview, hypothetically, okay? okay? So I'm going into a job interview, and I have, um, of the, I'm going to make this easy for me, of the 10 things they're looking for, eight of them, boy, I nail those. I mean, I've got it. It's legitimate. There's no issue, no question about it. The two that I don't, I, I, I don't really have, but I, if I had them, I really feel like I'd get the interview. So if I'm using your example, hands forward, if I'm using your example, here's the real world, and I'm comfortable over here with those eight things, but over here I've got the two. Right. Now, a question to you, either one of two things strikes me, either A, I don't really know what they're going to ask. So most of the time I want to live in this world. It's comfortable. It's easy. Yeah. But when they come over here, I, I concoct a lie and give you a cue. 
that that's mm -hmm. happened. Okay. Or the alternative, I'm comfortable over here, but I know there's two things they probably will ask about. So I think in advance about what I'm going to say, I just mm -hmm. transfer this over here and I live in this world because when you ask me, well, do you have a, you know, a doctorate or do you have a master's or what medals do you have or whatever the thing I want to lie about is, going back and forth is uncomfortable. Just living in the lie would be much more comfortable. But is that an indication of, I don't know what you call it, I don't know what the psychological term is, but just a compulsive liar versus someone who gets caught in a lie? Right. Now, pathological lying or compulsive lying is typically a symptom of a greater problem of personality. Okay. Uh, it's a symptom of something else is wrong. Now, for example, and, and the way I would handle, for example, your job interview you're talking about, for, for, let's say somebody were to say, we're counseling, this is what you do with your interview. You say, now, I would, I'm not, don't have these two areas. I have knowledge of it, but I'm excited to learn because I believe I can master those skills. And when I put my heart and soul in something, I get it done. And so that way I overcome the line. Now, the best way to spot a lie, um, if you've heard of that thing that they call, what is it? Yeah, it's called Google. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. I teach my students that, you know, sometimes it's not that the person's not giving you information. You're not asking the right questions. Okay. So if you do a better job of Googling their mind, Googling their experience, you'll get, number one, better information. If they're being deceptive, it triggers stronger symptoms. For an uh, example, using class, if I Google plumber, how many hits would I get? Well, I did the other thing. 59 million. Okay. And I said, well, if you Google plumber, Jefferson County, well, it goes down to about 18 million. But there's 26 Jefferson counties in the United States. Plumber, Jefferson County, Kentucky, uh, Jefferson County, Kentucky. Now it gets smaller. Plumber, Jefferson County, Kentucky, tankless water heaters, smaller. Plumber, Jefferson County, Kentucky, we're not tankless water heaters, boom. Plumber, Jefferson County, Kentucky, we're not water heaters, expert installers, is down to 688. Okay. So if you're the interviewer, and I'm looking to see if you're being honest with me, if you're not getting a response, you think it's a little shallow, use better penetrating questions, and that triggers a better response, and you dig deeper. Now the person who's deliberately trying to deceive you, they're forced to live in that disrupted world, and it's harder to sustain that. It's harder to keep together. Gotcha. Now, I'm assuming, Stan, that, uh, and we're getting close to a, a second break, but I'm assuming that in a lot of cases when you're involved or, well, you get involved, um, mm -hmm. there's a concern about what's the truth and wanting to get to that truth. Um, mm -hmm. Now, my experience, nothing like yours at all, but my experience is said if you ask someone a question that they're unprepared for, they generally will tell you the truth because they haven't had time to prepare the lie. If, Would you if agree? It was, well, yeah, if it's an unexpected, unexpected question, yes. Okay. In fact, that, that tactic is what we use in what's roadside interdiction uh, interviews, but also in anti terrorist operations. Ask that subject questions they aren't prepared for. And that creates that disrupted balance because you catch them off guard. Gotcha. It's a good gotcha. tactic. Now, so when we get back, I, I'm, I'm kind of interested. I, again, as I said, I love the book that you wrote, The Truth About Lying. Uh, my guest is Stan Walters. He is the lie guy. And there are so many things and so many places that, that, that we can go with this. Um, because obviously, if we can... Um, diffuse someone that is an, in an angry place or that is lying and move them into a place where the truth comes out. Um, obviously, in the long run, that's better for everybody, even though sometimes telling the truth creates a consequence. I've lived that, that you might not want to live, but the reality of it is it sets you free as well. So when we get back, we're going to talk more about some of the things that we can do, some of the true signs of deception. How do you know if you can trust somebody in a business relationship? And I absolutely want to talk about what do you see when you see politicians talking? I just, that to me is going to be absolutely classic. But Stick with us. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. My guest is Stan Walters. You can find out all kinds of information and get great information from his website, thelieguy.com. We'll be back in just a moment. 
We're back with my guest, Stan Walter, the lie guy. I, I, I love this tagline and the fact that you uh, are such an expert when it comes to deception, uh, discovering the truth. Um, so let me go to something that's really kind of, um, um, I guess what I'll call on the front burner of uh, people's minds, the uh, the riots in Baltimore and the, 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 the reality that today, this show is pre-recorded, but the reality today that, you know, several members of the police department were indicted. If you were involved in the process, do you think that it would be uh, fairly easy and quick to come to the truth? Or do folks who are in um, positions of authority, whether it's police, I'm not, not knocking police by any stretch of the imagination, whether it's police or politicians or whomever, but people who are in a position of authority, is it just easier for them to, because of the job they have, perhaps be in deceptive situations? Part of it, I think, still goes back to the character of that, that person in that position, whether it's, whether it's the corporate leader or whether it's the government leader or the public servant. Uh, what do they have at stake? You know, uh, even lies of stake. One thing we always think of, remember, that deception, even the social things we talk about, you know, your haircut looks nice. The first person that benefits out of deception is the liar. Right. It, right. Always, it was always benefiting them first. So even the lies of state or state governments and, and large entities and world world entities and so forth. It, now, getting to the truth, uh, one of the things, for example, that would happen within the Baltimore case with this unfortunate death is we would do a bunch of narrative interviews. We'd get all the witnesses and they'd be separated. And they did the same thing in Ferguson or with uh, Casey Anthony, for example, in Orlando. Right. Tell me what happened. And we do what's called a narrative interview without any assumptions, without any preconceptions. Isn't that critical? Because if you think that you're going to see a sign or you believe the person's already going to lie to you, you're already biased. And it's like that show, uh, I think it's on Animal Planet, Looking for Bigfoot. I, right. I, bet you, I bet you it's not a single episode when they go, well, we didn't find nothing to nap. They're always going to find Bigfoot or, you know, a clump of hair or something, right? Right. So for the true justice uh, in Benjamin Israeli, only uh, – Jewish Prime Minister of England, 19th century. Justice is truth in action. And that's what they should shoot for here. What in the integrity of the government and officials thing and the value of that. Chips fall where they may and hold people accountable. Make that the premium. You know, it's um it, it's a challenging so what the word I want to use. It, it's challenging place that we live where uh, it seems that the concept of lying and deception is the norm when it comes to politics. Yeah. And I don't, I'm, I'm, it's not an, you know, an indictment of people who uh, truly have their heart in public service. I, I think that's wonderful, but yet um, it's, it's kind of funny because the, um, uh, the show house of cards on Netflix is, is, you know, this, this uh, depiction of supposedly what politics is like, and and it's been interesting because many politicians have said, you know, they got it ninety percent right, and and it's like really well, that's sad because so much of it is based upon the concept of lying. Yes, for immediate gain, but how you ever keep up with all of that is mind-boggling. Absolutely, absolutely. And then one thing we think of too is, and we go back to George Orwell. And if everybody remembers, he wrote Animal Farm in 1984, and it's about right. uh, particularly governments and socialism. And he wrote a paper in 1946, and he talked about the language that governments use. At the time, and I don't remember the country, but they were involved in the, quote, pacification of the dissenters. Well, what pacification was, was genocide. And so it was that soft word for that. And he said we should always be aware of governments that use uh, uh, euphemisms are soft words to defend the indefensible. And I think if we, if our governments and if our leaders find themselves having to do that, then we've got a serious problem with the quality of the character of our leaders. And our jobs as, as, as voters is we demand that character from them. But there's always gray, you know, and there is negotiations, and I know there's no pure black and white. But we somewhere we've got to find that, that middle of the integrity. 
So how, how does it, I have to ask this question, how does it work for you when the, I know you are a very busy man, and, and again, for those that um, uh, want really some cool information from a website, yours is great in terms of having good content that people can go to, that is theliguy.com, but from your perspective, when you get to see it on TV or on the newscast or so forth, do you get to the place where you can look and you can tell that guy lying through his teeth? Or is yeah. it more difficult? You can do that. Yeah. And, you know, so it, I'm sorry, I'm lying through the teeth. I was just at a conference uh, Thursday in, or Tuesday in Kansas City, and I had some dental people there. <laughs> You're going to love this punchline. They said, lying through your teeth doesn't count as flossing. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> a great line. Me, that's a, that needs to be on the sign right above the dental chair. Lying through the teeth doesn't count as flossing. Oh, but, that's too funny. Yeah, but, you know, I do when I see cases or some – you know, major uh, missing child or missing parents or a spouse comes up. And of course, I kind of keep my senses on autopilot until something happens and it, it kind of comes on. And I'll say, wait a minute, we got, they got a problem here. I, there's a problem here. I don't like that answer. And I have a tendency to yell at the television a lot. <laughs> and people think I've lost it. <laughs> but yeah, it, it jumps out at me. And then there's times when the when news agencies uh, if you check, for example, on YouTube, you see several things I've done in the past of major uh, murder cases and so forth uh, through Fox and ABC and NBC and CBS. And they're asked, what's your assessment? What do you see? And I said, well, in this person's behavior, these answers, this is where I have problems as the interviewer, as an investigator. That's what they should be looking at. Interesting. Now, uh, okay, so I've got uh, one other quick question, which never crossed my mind until we got into this. So have you ever watched television? You see this case taking place. You're watching what's happening, and you're yelling at the TV because it's like, no, check this. Have you ever picked up the phone and called them and said, hey, guys, this is Stan the Lie Guy. You need to consider these things. I've, I've done that, and you'd be surprised at the answers I've gotten. Really? Yep, some that are not repeatable in public. Okay. So I've gotten to the point – um, they know I'm there and if they want me, they'll call me, but I've called to offer and account. And there's, I understand a certain territoriality and, and agencies and corporations, they want to take care of, of their own problem. And sometimes if I had come in and try to insert myself, that's, I'm like an interloper. Right. Uh, but there are times that agents say, we need your help. We've got a, a child that's missing, or we've got a, a couple that there's a problem with. We have a, uh, police officers that's in trouble. You know, is the informant telling the truth? Is the officer telling the truth? And I'm more than glad to help them out. And I do that frequently, uh, help them a lot. Now, Stan, I, I'm going to go down a completely different road for just a second. Um, you and I both are uh, uh, connected with the National Speakers Association. We speak on different topics, but there's a kind of awesome. interesting relationship since I, I speak on ethics. But as you know, um, I speak on ethics because I participated in unethical behavior, um, and not that I'm proud of it, but it, it created an interesting experience. And so from that experience back in the late 80s when I was a young whippersnapper and a bit of a, a, a dumbass, I guess I can say that on the radio. If not, they can bleep it out. But, <laughs> but I created a Ponzi scheme. Didn't know what it was called at the time. Sure. Didn't start off with the idea that, gee, I want to be a, 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 a fraudster. Mm -hmm. um, I had a very simple problem. I, I, I needed some money for a house payment and didn't have an immediate source. So I used a source that was immediately available. And of course, I convinced myself that, rationalized, that it was a loan. So mm -hmm. I had need, opportunity, and rationalization, the fraud triangle. But I, I, after a while, I started looking at, okay, well, what do other fraudsters do? And there seemed to be a pattern. The pattern I call the pit. There's a promise that's mm -hmm. made. Uh, the promise is followed with an illusion. Typically, there is something that I portray to you that's real, that's not. And most of the time, those frauds are committed against people that are close, that there's a trust with. Right. Far easier for a fraudster to commit a fraud to uh, someone close to them, family, friends, and or business associates than it would be, for example, to you if they don't know you. Right. So do you find, or maybe we can talk about this in the next, next segment at, at, at a point, but do you find that there's anything that a person should do, especially the elderly that seem to be so uh, subjected to people taking advantage of them? anything that somebody could do immediately to just start to detect 
or have their radar up or antenna up to prevent that? If you've got that one really good close confidant, and, and the elderly kind of hit close to me because both my mom and stepdad were victims of a uh, home health caregiver that stole $25,000 out of their account. Oh, my goodness. And um, do you have one person who has that durable power of attorney or that individual can represent you that you have trust in them? Because, you know, as, as their parents get older in, in 70s and 80s and so forth, they develop a certain amount of distrust to begin with that everybody's trying to take something from them. And so that's why we do a better job with our laws and protecting its elder abuse and elder fraud and so forth. But I like the concept of the pit. Interesting, your, your pattern fits. The biggest frauds that are perpetrated in like banking institutions and so forth, there's fewer of them, but it's the higher end, the upper echelon, vice presidents, executive VPs, and so forth that have the biggest losses because they're in a position of trust. Well, the new employees have little bitty ones. Right. Tiny ones here and there. But the higher up in the chain of, of the authority of the corporation, that's where they take your biggest losses from. Those are people in trust. WorldCom um, debacle in 2002, I believe it was, fits that. $11 billion in fraud where the auditors and everybody were lying up the chain all the way up to the CEO. Right. You know, it's fascinating to see how that works and 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 to be aware that, like you're, you said, the, the, the guys at the top of the food chain are the ones with the biggest losses, but yet most companies look to try to minimize it amongst the people who are in the lower echelon, which tells me we're looking in the wrong place. But, you know, at, at any event, um, we're going to get back and talk a little bit more about the truth about lying. And my guest is Stan Walters, the lie guy. This has been so much fun. And when we come back, we're going to come back and talk about some of the practical applications that you can use whenever you think about areas in your life. Uh, interviewing, uh, yeah, I think it'd be kind of funny if I was your child, and especially if I was your daughter, what it would be like if you had somebody coming in for a date. But we'll talk about that in just a minute. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. We'll be right back. Well, my guest is Stan Walters. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. And man, this has been so much fun. I mean, it is so cool to talk with The Lie Guy. And in fact, that's his website, thelieguy.com. It's a wealth of wonderful resources. And we've been talking about how to detect lying and what happens in life. And, you know, Stan, I think as we as we end this show, let's talk about some of the areas where we need to as as, as people be thinking about uh, where the deception might take place, you know, events, life event type things, but where that deception might take place and, and get kind of conscious, so to speak. And, and we, we ended the last segment talking a bit about your, your daughters, and I, and I cannot imagine, you know, <laughs> the boyfriend coming in, seeing you, because, you know, number one, if I was the daughter, I would be petrified. You know, if he lied, okay, dad's going to come down on him. And so it had to be a different experience. It, it was fun. Yeah. They would always say, uh, my dad catch people who lie. Go ahead and tell them a story. See if he can catch you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> then you show him your gun collection. Oh, that's even better. That, 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 that puts the icing on the cake. <laughs> by the but, way, by the way, did you ever, did you ever in this process, I have to ask, catch the boyfriend lying or get a feeling like, you know what, darling, you don't need to be with him and it pan out? Uh, yes. Okay. And I've got a granddaughter now that's uh, almost 18. And so we're going through the dating stuff again. And there's been times I've told my daughters, I said, you know, I work with a lot of special forces people and intelligence people. Um, he either straightens up or they won't find his body. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. And, you know, so oh too funny. <laughs> but you leverage your power. You know, what you're talking about hey, catching deception. You know who the best uh, lie to, uh, people best at catching lies are? They've, they've tested. They've said all kinds of people. Prison inmates. Oh, really? Fascinating. They, they As a group, they catch an average of 68% of the lies that are told to them, where the rest of the population is only 50-50. Now, the tactic they use, think about a con game. Think what they do they elicit information from you and let you talk. They don't put their, their stuff out first. They listen to you and see where they can catch you, and you set yourself up. So uh, to me, the best people who are, are good at catching lies are the ones who ask really good questions, but also learn to listen and wait for the information to come to them. 
I was doing a study about investigative interviewers and doing some research and two types of approaches. Now think of this, for example, if your kids or maybe an employee um, that's done something wrong at work. Now you could come in and be all accusatory. I told you not to do that. I know you lied right, 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 right in their face, right? Right. Well, immediately, what if by chance you're wrong? You've just destroyed employee relationship. Right. And you've already put shock ways to destroy your organization. And now, if you, you are right, you've attacked this person, what mentally they're going, mentally they're going to do? They're going to collapse. Of course. It's better and to give them respect and say, tell me what happened. I want to hear from your side of the story, your version of events. And from your point of view, I wasn't there. I want to find out what you were thinking, what was going on. That's a more narrative interview. So asking questions to show, tell, describe, explain are better than just asking yes or no or attacking or jumping on the person. I found in one study that interviewers ask an average of three questions per minute. Really? Three questions per minute. When you're talking that much, you're not hearing information. You're hearing your own voice. And I spotted this this past week, added it to my presentation from Dalai Lama. When you talk, you're hearing what you already know. When you listen, you're going to learn something new. That's the way that you catch deception. And it also honors the other person, gives them the opportunity to be honest with you. And give, you know, make that assumption, give you a chance to be honest. Then if you're dishonest, then we can deal with the problem. Why you feel you need to be dishonest? Are you concerned about the punishment? Concerned about your accountability? Or that you've done something wrong that we need to correct? But we can handle that jointly as opposed to being at loggerheads with each other. Right. And, you, and I'm probably preach, teaching your your ethics presentations right off the bat. <laughs> well, you know, the, the thing that I find interesting is, um, and I don't teach this, but I have practiced in it for a number of years, which was sales. And it's so fascinating because salespeople, especially those of us that like to talk, get so caught up in the talking that you're not listening to the consumer. The consumer will tell you what it is they want and why they want it if you'll just shut up. That's it. Uh, there was an interview that I have that I use in class. The, uh, the kind of it's it's a hard case, but the the officer comes in before he goes to the interview. He hands his weapon to another officer and says, "Here, keep this. I'm afraid I'll kill this guy." Well, right off the bat, he is absolutely the wrong mindset to be doing that interview. Right. Well, he is pounding his fist. He's pointing his finger at the guy, and the subject says, "Can I tell you what happened?" He wants to talk. The interviewer says, "Answer my question." The guy says, man, give me a chance to talk and I'll tell you what happened. He said, I told you, answer my question. So a lot of the times, if we're a victim of deception, 50% of the fault is ours for not setting up a scenario, setting up a condition where the honesty will be honored and not respecting the other person, let them talk and explain their actions. We put the media on the defensive because we think we have to dominate and control when it should be an even flow of conversation back and forth. Interesting. Now, when we first started the interview, one of the comments that you made was it was a statistic. I don't have the exact numbers, but a, a good number, a goodly number of people who are submitting resumes for interviews are are padding the resume. They're right. embellishing, lying, mm -hmm. but embellishing, whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, so when you receive that as the interviewer, as the employer, you don't really know that it's embellished unless – you spend time on the front end or back end, whichever the case is, verifying the data. Mm -hmm. So so, so I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that as an interviewer, okay, I got the resume and that got me in front of the person, but then I need to kind of toss the resume and carry on the conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously with the limitations with human resources, which you can and can't ask, I might say in your resume that you have worked on the new specification of the gold widget. Okay. I said, wow, tell me when you had that first idea to do this. Go through the whole process of how you thought about making that new gold widget and how you got everybody on board and how you got the team together. Tell me how that went. And so now I'm asking the narrate, if you've never done it, the story won't right. call us. Right. And I quickly find out. But I'm again honoring the person, giving them a chance to tell me the truth. And if they are honest, I'm going to get a wonderful description. Hey, this is a great employee. They're a great team player. They could pull people together. Interesting. 
So, so um, we've got three minutes left. And Stan, as I said before on your uh, website, theliguy.com, you really have a lot of great information and a lot of helpful tools. If you were to, um, to share with the audience two to three things that you really want people to know about deception, detecting deception, and ways to be able to protect yourself, what would they be? It, number one is, is learn what the deception, and those are easy to pick up if you look through some research, and be a much better listener, listen well, but ask the right questions, and be patient and let the person respond. Everything you're going to want is, is going to come from that individual. It's not from us forcing it from them or um, uh, accusing them or a confrontational style. It's when there's mutual respect between the parties whether it's the person's a victim, the witness, or the employee who's made the mistake. And honor their humanity and let them do that. And the other thing is, if you are a victim of deception, 50% of the fault lies with you. Because it takes two for a lot of work. It takes a lot of somebody to believe it. So work on your listening skills. And then there's a certain amount, are we believing the liar's lie? Sometimes it's a lot easier to believe the lie because we want to hear, do not want to hear the truth any more than the liar wants to tell it. So sometimes we caught, we don't want to hear it either. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's fascinating that you say that because um, as we wrap things up, I, I can say in looking at lots of people who have been deceivers and scammers, um, most of the time, as, it's, as I say, it starts off with an incredible promise. And what is it that the person wants to hear? They want to feel special. Yep. They want to feel like that they have something that other people aren't going to get and they will buy into the promise, even though intellectually they know it's too doggone good to be true. That's it. Um, now, with that said, um, Stan, I thank you so much for being on the show. This has been great. Uh, my guest, Stan Walters, The Lie Guy. Go to theliguy.com. There's lots of great information. And I would also encourage you pick up the book, The Truth About Lying. That's not the only book that he's written. There's a multitude of things there. And if you're an employer, I would strongly suggest for one of your meetings, consider hiring Stan. He is a certified speaking professional absolutely top of his game and one of the types of folks that you would want to have and people would be like, you know what, I can remember that presentation because there was something you could walk away with that is tangible and beneficial. So thank you for taking the time to be on the show, Stan. Thanks for inviting me. It's been a great time, Chuck. Oh, thank you. So for those of you listening on Straight Talk Radio, this is Chuck Gallagher. And remember, Every choice we make in life has a consequence. Hope you've enjoyed the show. Stick with us next week where we'll have other great guests. We'll be back soon. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. Tune in each week on TransformationTalkRadio.com each Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern as Chuck Gallagher, international speaker and author, cuts through the noise to share truth through transparency. Nationally known guests talk about what's important to you, your life, your concerns, and your success. Visit ChuckGallagher.com for more information and turn on to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. 